Uh, welcome, everybody, once again to Occultus Anonymous, our little uh, home on the internet. Um, we are continuing our ongoing series of mini series as Drew takes a break from our regular Mage the Awakening game. And uh, this is sort of the just a little wrap up slash foreshadowing for the um, Star Trek adventures um, that we're just bringing to a close. We are, as always, uh, brought to you by Roll20 and the viewers like you, specifically Ryan, Thomas, Noba, Perry, Michael, Cat Feathers, Josh, Alexander, Puppeteer, Email, Moku, Melissa, Doc, Other Guy, Bernie, John, Al. They're coming out of the wall sphincters. We all know who that is. <laughs> yeah. Penny, Zoltan, Funzo Super Ali, Milo V3. A Vortex Falcon 00, Adele, Crazy Man 1772, George, Chris, Shaksara, Camo, Taryn, Riafio, Ms. Grumpy, Mwahahaha, <laughs> uh, Buck, Mozart D minor, Fug, IRL, Arilla, Remington, Wannabe, Everyone Needs Aspirations, Shane, James, Chandra, John, Klaus, Porter, Alsrit, Long Live the Queen, Alex, and Sean. Thank you very much for your support. We really appreciate it. Uh, Money Raised Super Tran goes to do things like uh, pay awesome artists for incredible artwork, um, replace equipment, and things of that nature. Um, so we really appreciate you guys uh, giving us um, support. Now we are using the Star Trek Adventures uh, rules um, published by Modifius. Um, it's a great system. I really enjoy it. Um, it's uh, based on a D20 system, but uh, low numbers are good, high numbers are bad, ones are criticals, and 20s are critical fails. Um, and um, we are basing our story on the Star Trek intellectual property, which is something that has a lot of lore and a lot of detail, and it really lends itself to that. But we're not, what this game is about isn't about that level of detail. We're not too concerned about the official you know, dates that things did, happened and what the actual crew complement is of a specific Starship model. Um, we're using that intellectual property as the painting canvas to paint you in a containing word picture. Uh, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, when we last left the, our crew of the USS Curity, um, they had just resolved um, sort of a complicated um, conundrum uh, on a mystery planet. Um, there was a race of queens that were apparently the descendants of beings that traveled to Earth and became the Greek god Pantheon. Um, this was reinforced by a, a report that somebody recalled from the USS Enterprise, where they apparently met Apollo. So these folks appear to have been the genetic ancestors of those folks. When they left their planet, they had no more concern for earthly things and material stuff and the physical world. Um, and they had a uh, very advanced AI that was sort of running all of their systems for them, and they left it behind. Um, their intent was to shut it down, but it asked to not be shut down. It didn't wish to be shut down, so they left it running. In the centuries since those folks left, um, that AI devised a plan to recreate its creators and have them ascend to the same level of mental ability where they could just leave their bodies and become beings of thought and energy um, with the intent of taking it with them when they left. Um, this led to um, a stagnation of culture and of course he didn't have a viable population, he only had one genetic sample to work from. So the caretaker decided to just grab people passing by and um, put them into a mix to try and advance the sample that he had to the point where they would be able to ascend and take them with them. Um, there were some tense episodes. Uh, a lot of the aliens were suddenly brought back to the realization of who they were and where they were. It wasn't always happy. Um, there's all kinds of different personalities and um, um, instincts out there in the wider galaxy. But we managed to sort through all that, get the queens unbrainwashed, um, talk down the caretaker into working with these folks that he had um, created, essentially. Um, and we ended up with a peaceful resolution. Um, as that was all getting sorted out and people were getting back to their lives um, with the help of the USS Curie and um, the Syracuse, um, you had contact with a, a group of aliens that were on returning to their ship and talked about they had seen a ship like yours before. 
Um, and to your knowledge, this whole area has been unexplored. So in questioning them, you learned that there was a derelict ship that had the same sort of design features as a Curie. But based on their description, it sounds an awful lot like a Constitution class heavy cruiser. Um, the original five year missions were based on the Constitution class model, and many or several of those ships just never returned, went out on their five year mission, and were never heard from again. So if this is one of those, it would definitely be of interest to Starfleet and to you. Um, and I think that's where we left off. Did I miss any salient points anyone wants to touch on? Who's the main one? Okay, I guess we can roll that intro. Space, the final frontier. These are the brave adventures of the Starship Curie, whose three-year mission is to explore new worlds, to seek out new civilizations, and to boldly go where no one has gone before. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back. And uh, we're going to pick up following leads provided um, from folks that you rescued. You've made your way into a new region of space that's not too far out of your way. Uh, the Curie is flying solo again. Uh, the Syracuse has resumed, resumed their exploration path. So you guys are a little bit off of where you were supposed to be, but following this lead was deemed valuable enough to do so. Um, you know, your contacts reported that it was in a region of space that was very rich at, um, in minerals and lots of prospecting and mining uh, opportunities there. They called it uh, the Hikil Void. Um, they also said that it was a very dangerous place. Many ships go missing there, but it's very rich in prospect, uh, prospecting. Um, so in the source of searching for this mystery ship, the Curie has located this void. It's a region of space roughly 50 light years in diameter. Um, and the single most important factor about all this is that there isn't a single star within that envelope. Oh, um, wow. Based on the local region's stellar density, you expect somewhere between 150 and 200 stars in a region of space that size, but there's no light visible being emitted from within this this uh, void. Um, now, as you're doing your observations and things like that, you're not detecting the signs of any stars, but um, the science team um, and with your advanced sensors has detected that there are, based on um, Doppler effects for stars surrounding this region and some gravitational lensing that you're seeing of light passing through, there are stellar masses within the region, but there isn't anything that's emitting light. Um, so there's definitely an oddity that mm. you guys have never encountered before. You've, there's voids that you've encountered and expanses where there's regions of very low density stars, but they're not, they're obviously uh, based on the behavior of other star systems around the perimeter. There's no extra masses in there acting as if there were stars. Right, and I'm sure we're taking into account like black holes that might be at the region. It definitely could be that that could be the case. This could okay. be, like, but this would be also a singular entity in your exploration of the galaxy so far to have an entire region that's nothing but black holes. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they show up on our sensors with stars, but we can't see anything? No, there's no, um, based on um, your sensors as you're sort of moving into this region, you're not picking up any emissions, no electromagnetic emissions, no black water radiation. Um, it, uh, so uh, optically, it looks like there's just empty space, but you're detecting the signs of gravity. So okay. there are stellar masses somewhere in there. You just can't mm -hmm. see them. Um, um, so you have moved into this um, very dark region um, without light um, from nearby stars. You know, things seem much gloomier. You know, when you're looking out, um, out the ship, you're not seeing the hull illuminated by light from just stars. It's all kind of dark and, and much dimmer. So you're having to um, rely a lot more on your sensors as you guys are moving through. Following the course, go ahead. Sorry, mm -hmm. I feel like I missed a step. Is this where the ship is? In this region was where they discovered that derelict ship. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. I thought this was new scenario, and we and I had yep. completely missed resolving <laughs> the derelict ship. And I was like, 
I know nope. I did not space out that hard. <laughs> yeah, nope, not at all. Um, right. So you're so following... Did... Go ahead. They didn't mention this weirdness to us, just that there was a ship here somewhere? They just uh, talked about it was a dangerous place, um, and they called it the, um, um, the Hikil Void. Okay. And, you know, described, you know, it's a place where there's no stars and stuff, but they, there's like... Yeah. Still stuff where they can find minerals yeah, and things like that. Greg. Yep. Once we cross the boundary into the formal designated area of the Hiko Void, mm -hmm. you would see Captain Trichelor standing uh, near the view screen looking into it. And uh, he says, Down from Olympus, we descend into Hades. Yes. <laughs> Motherfucker, hang on. We ha we're gonna have a talk about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Soapbox. Uh, <laughs> um, and just informally amongst the crew, as you guys are traveling through this region, there's uh, like a lot of folks are sort of half joking about staring into the void. Like, so you know, the joke is don't stare out the, the view screens or the windows mm -hmm. as you guys are moving through this area because there's nothing to see but blackness, and you don't want to. Mm -hmm. See eyes staring back at you. Um, so as you guys are uh, exploring this region, yeah. um, following the course that your um, contacts gave you, eventually long range sensors do pick up um, what appears to be a starship of some kind. All right. Uh, so you guys alter course and move to uh, intercept. Um, and it's just, it, there's no planetary system. It, this is an area of like um, very low gravity binding. Um, mm. So this would be like interstellar space effectively. Yeah. Um, and sensors are definitely picking up um, a ship. Your computer identifies it as a constitution class. Uh, sensors detect no energy signatures of any kind, no life sign. Um, and you can pull it up on the view screen. You can just sort of barely see the shadow that's slightly lighter than the surrounding inky blackness. Uh, but with no energy signatures and no way of establishing contact, like it's just a, it's a hulking mass in front of you. Unless you wanted to like send out shuttles or something to investigate and illuminate it. In the probe. Sure. Um, so sending out a probe or shuttles just as a flavor thing. I mean, might as well start with the probe, but... Okay. Yeah, first... Yeah. Yep. Um, so setting out a probe, at, um, and a probe doesn't like emit visual light and stuff, it's all sensors and data that comes back. So um, probes do a, an investigation. There's no damage to the hull that can be seen. Mm. Um, the probes are reporting that there is an oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere contained within. There doesn't appear to be any... Um, uh, um, any sections of the ship that are exposed to hard vacuum. Mm. So the ship looks fully intact, but no life signs, no power of any kind. Um, in fact, you're still reading like the complement of shuttles is on board. Wow. That's all still there. Captain, permission to take a shuttle crew. Permission granted. <laughs> okay. Um, just to build up a little momentum in case we need it, why don't you give me a um, um, a con roll? Sure. Oh yeah. Just for maneuvering around the ship. It's difficulty zero. This is just to build up. You're rounding up your crew. Mm -hmm. And are you planning on boarding or just are you just uh, investigating? From uh, the yeah. Um, for I'm gonna go ahead and roll here con and control, right? Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, no the. Uh, uh, Two successes there. Um, mm -hmm. The the commander is like uh, you know, Lieutenant Shavor. Wait, no. Exactly. I, is every time, and it's like right here in front of me too. Yeah, Lieutenant Zakolnin, uh Though Shavor, I do one as well. Yeah. Um, I think that's also her rank, so that's what makes it. Um, yeah, easy I think she's a lieutenant too. Oh, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Um, and then uh, probably Levine um, as my co-pilot. Um, and anybody else, Captain? That seems sufficient to me. Yep. Yeah, you got security science, someone help fly. Mm -hmm. Yep, and between you and I, kind of engineering, so, yep. Great. Um, um, and, the, and the Captain also reinforces, he says, 
in the event that you need Jiffus. I'm sure he'd be happy to head over. Yep. All right. Um, so as you're sort of flying over the hull, um, oh, your just, visual... Sorry, just one little what? thing is that, like, <laughs> as everybody's getting kitted up, um, you know, the commander's like, prepare for hazmat, because we had no idea what may actually be on 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 the or inside the ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you'll need to do uh, atmospheric scans and stuff like that to see what the air quality is like and all that. Um, so as you're um, flying past the ship, I'm assuming you're feeding live visuals back to the yeah, got the full the lights up, so everybody mm -hmm. back on the. So yeah, you can see the as the um, shuttle um, sort of rounds over in a cell. You see a hull number come into view. Oh. Now, very clearly, you see NCC 1709. Uh, this was the USS Valiant, uh, one of the first ships sent out on the five year missions. Um, and again, visual scans, everything looks fully intact. Um, but there is no power. So um, there's no attempt, there's no way to interface with the docking bay. Uh, to get it open, so you're going to have to use one of the external hatches. Um, so head up to the saucer section um, right. where there's a, a, a... Go ahead. Yeah. Real, real quick bit of color. <clears throat> As they were heading over, it's likely that no one was paying direct attention to the captain. So it's probably the only the external audience was, were the only ones to see this. Um, captain was gripping the railing or gripping the back of his chair, right? With clenched fists. And as they scan over the name, they gently release, and he lets out in a held breath. Um, so you make your way over the saucer section um, and uh, land on the hull and secure an airlock into the emergency hatch. And uh, you guys now have access. The scans show it's um, mostly safe. It would be unpleasant, um, but it's uh, certainly viable to survive and breathe in there. Okay. Um, Still not gonna. No, absolutely. <laughs> um, and uh, Lieutenant, if you can patch in the dock to... I was actually going to sort of counterpoint Ralph's thing by saying that Cap the dock would be on the bridge, like being fed info. At a science station? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yep, cool. for sure. All right, yeah, probably at the Lieutenant's normal station. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um... So you guys uh, work the release, and there's, um, you know, the psh, there's pressures equalized, and then you open up the hatch and uh, climb down inside. Um, you're in uh, one of the outer um, outer sections of the ship, um, and as you climb down, you know, scan around with your lights um, in your um, effectively you're wearing spacesuits. Right, and we've got um, no gravity too, right? Um, mm, yeah, no gravity. Um, power is down, uh, the gravity plating is off. Um, the first thing you notice is that there's a sheen of frost all over everything. Whoa. Mm -hmm. um, just weird. probably moisture precipitating out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I guess it does have still a valid atmosphere, so. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and from this position, you can see um, a couple of corpses um, also covered in a fine layer of frost. Uh, de yeah. definitely scanning those. <laughs> yeah, just mm. immediately going straight to them and start feeding as much information as possible back to the doctor, like images, anything I can pick up from the body with the scanner. Okay, um, so just a quick scan of the first couple that you find. There's no signs of any wounds. Um, they appear to be um, in, I mean, they're dead and they've had exposure to um, um, severe cold for an extended period of time. So there's that sort of kind of cellular decay from just ice crystals and things like that disintegrating. Oh, or like the like ice mummies, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much. Um, but other than that, there doesn't appear to be anything particularly wrong with them. Um, it's not like they have wounds, there's no phaser burns, it doesn't appear to be a, a, a fight or anything like that. There's no injuries that you can tell. Um, I, uh, um, but as you guys move through, uh, where are you headed? The bridge. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to try to get somewhere where I can patch into some sort of a computer system. 
Sure. And there are computer terminals, but they're all like completely dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I figured like we probably have like some sort of portable portable power sources. Yep. Sure. Easy enough to rig one of those up. Um and I'll, I'll assume you want to do that on the bridge where you have the most Yeah, where there'll be the most information. Okay. Uh, so as you guys uh, make your way to the bridge, um, you see um, what looks like uh, some engineering crew were around some sort of a device. On the bridge? Um, no, this is uh, in a corridor um, heading towards the bridge. And as you're moving towards the center of the ship from the outer hull, you're definitely like the the crew density is increasing. Right, um, so it looks like um, whatever happened on the outside, people started migrating inward. Um, and that's where whatever brought them down, brought them down. Um, so there's a, it's a device that you haven't seen before. It looks like it was sort of cobbled together very quickly. Um, and it's not immediately clear what it does. It has some sort of an emitter. It might even be some kind of a shield generator, mm. um, just based on a cursory ex- uh, examination. Um, and you guys are having to manually open up um, bulkhead doors um, and things like that. But uh, eventually you um, climb um, a ladder and emerge uh, through an access hatch onto the bridge. Um, and the bridge is, it looks like a, a chaotic scene happened here. Uh, it looks like um, people were at their stations until the last moment. So you see, like somebody's looks like they would been running for a lift before they collapsed. Um, so the crew is kind of scattered around as if they were at their stations when they fell. Um, the only one that's not is sitting in the captain's chair. Uh, you see a female Andorian uh, wearing the gold uniform of command. She has on her lap um, an odd little device. Um, that seems to be like an aperture or a, um, a housing, uh, some sort of a crystal. Um, and as you scan, there's no power. And as you're scanning the computers, like the um, the computers are completely dead. Like there's no, even if you pull out a chip and scan, like there's no data there. It's like it's all been reset or um, zeroed out somehow. Everything is wiped. Everything is wiped. Uh, can um, I try to scan the? You said she's holding like a crystal in a housing. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get too close to it. Sure. Um, and you recognize like these are materials that you would find like in engineering bay. So it looks like somebody cobbled something together at the last moment kind of in a hurry or something and like there's no housing on it like a normal engineer would do um so it looks like it's something that might have been created in a hurry uh give me a reason science rule it's difficulty one so Starfleet still uses um, like effectively advanced data tapes um, to store their data on and things like that. Um, but you've been uh, Starfleet has been experimenting with um, using crystal lattices for data storage and are able to exceedingly increase their data density. So this is sort of like the wax cylinder version of an audio recording, except this is like the earliest, like an early prototype of what a crystal data recorder would be. Um, I want to secure it then. Like, I'm still a little leery about bringing any of this stuff back onto our ship just because we don't know what happened here. Do I have, like, do we have, like, sealed I'm sure we do. Containers, yeah, to collect samples from places. Um, And I will tell you that there does appear to be, like, data ports built into the device that could connect to a tricorder. What were you saying, Chris? I say I know this bit of Star Trek lore is that when you get beamed back, it decontams you. We didn't get beamed over. We can't wait around a shuttle. But you could. Yeah, stuff that Y'all knows could. about the stuff could get beamed back. That's true. Um. Yeah, I'm 
Andrew, do you want to plug into it and see? Go ahead. Okay. I will um, possibly I... sacrifice my tricorder. <laughs> um, and th- the tricorder does recognize um, data there, and it appears to be an audio file. This is the final log of Captain Eclara Andora, captain of the USS Valiant. Less than 30 minutes ago, our ship encountered an unknown energy cloud. Our scans produced an immediate aggressive reaction. Our attempts to disengage were unsuccessful. It was through our shields in moments. 40% of the crew were dead before casualty reports even started coming in. Main power went down before we even realized the full scope of this catastrophe. Our chief engineer managed to slow it down, but not stop it. We had plans, guesses really, but we no longer have the resources or or, or the personnel to implement them. We, I have lost the ship and Entire crew. It seemed to eat phaser fire. Proton torpedoes were likewise ineffective. The physical concussion from the torpedoes seemed to to uh, disperse portions of the cloud for for a time, but the energy produced was absorbed allowing the cloud to reform. It it attacks with tendrils, seeking out energy sources. We detected some sort of planetoid in the center of the cloud, but, but we lost main power before we could learn anything else about it. Active scans triggered an immediate response. If you encounter it, do not approach or scan it with active scanners unless you are prepared. Unless you are prepared. I'm told that the death this thing brings is painless. It's a small comfort to know that my crew did not suffer. Silence descends on the bridge. Have we seen any evidence of this energy cloud? Nothing. Didn't we run into an energy cloud? Hmm? Not recently. Wasn't that one of the interlude things that we had? Mm -hmm. There's some weird kind of low density energy cloud that we passed through. Disrupted uh, sensors, and we had to readjust oh. things to compensate. Mm-hmm. That was uh, to... subspace anomalies. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, yeah, I was just saying, silence... did the captain hear that? Yeah. <laughs> Assuming that the live feed was still going uh, as uh, as silence descends on the bridge, Captain Trichelor steps around uh, from behind his chair and uh, slumps into it and places his uh, head in his hands and then says um, Commander Jiffus and calls, you know through the computer I want you to devote all of your time uh, from this point forward to devising a means to shield all external transmission of energy from the hull. I need you to make it seem as though we're silent and we're a dead ship, dead in the water to anyone that might be looking at us. I'll explain later. Yes, sir. Thank you. Alright, for the three of you on the bridge, what do you what do you guys do next? 
Commander, or Captain, what should we do about the bodies? Takes him a second to respond, and he turns to uh, Dr. Hudson and says, Dr. Hudson, would you be prepared to establish a morgue? There's a lot of people, though. It's a bigger crew than ours, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Would say something I'd great. suggest that we Strain use one of the... I, I imagine that, that Commander Levine would be willing to temporarily surrender one of the shuttle bays until we're able to recover and uh, re- recover all of all of the personnel for subsequent um, burial space. Um, Lieutenant Matan, sir, the Constitution class has over twice our crew. I don't know that we have enough storage on board to hold that many. He pauses and he says, I won't let one member of their crew remain a lingering corpse on the husk of the ship they so valiantly piloted into this godforsaken void. Respectfully, sir, this is a rather fitting memorial until we can get Federation resources out here. We can ensure that they remain undisturbed on the ship that they loved and served on. Pauses for about five or ten seconds and says, We'll discuss it further when you return here. Dr. Hudson, if you will, um, please beam Captain and Dora into sickbay. Take whatever precautions you deem necessary. Very well. All right. Um, it's uh, the work of a few minutes. Um, if that, uh, when the transport activates and the body of Captain Andorra uh, vanishes to appear in sick bay. Um, she is frozen solid. Um, I don't know if you want to preserve that or begin the thawing out process. Um, but she's been... Yet. Okay. You make that order clear because he definitely would immediately. Oh, oh okay. Gotcha. Um, hmm. He'd say, uh, if you will, Dr. Hudson, uh, please don't... Oh, no. no. You can trust your judgment. It's fine. Yeah, she doesn't need to stay a block of ice. Um, so just to confirm um, something I said before, the computers here are all dead. So the only place that you found data was on that little crystal recording device. Um, you can provide external power to the computers and like, and they'll go through the motions of starting up, but there's nothing. They have no operating system. Just a little select do. boot drive kind of. Yeah, but not even that, like the fans will start spinning sort of thing, but that's all that will happen. Um, that's like the whole CMOS has been wiped out. Um, for the computer techie folks in the room. Um, for the main computer. Yeah, I don't know what else information we're going to get from any of the tech here then. Uh, no. Maybe go, maybe we should go investigate the shield that their engineers built that slowed it. Yep. The emitter. Yep. Um, She's yelling directly at me. <laughs> you need to pay attention to me, mother. Uh, but yes, we will retrieve the emitter. Uh, I am imagining that the crystal is now in the lieutenant's hands. Um, uh, but yeah, like off comms, just like within the immediate shuttle crew, the commander basically you know, says, uh, moving forward, this is a tomb. We will re- we'll treat it as such. Uh, nothing should be disturbed, um, save for the emitter and uh, let us make our way off of here carefully and gently. 
I was gonna like try to find a crew manifest, but I guess Starfleet doesn't need that. They know who is on the Valiant. Mm -hmm. Captain Chichalora knows as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, and you know, one of the last things before we left contact, I think Captain Chichalora would also suggest and uh, recognize that this might be a little naivete on his part, right? He says, uh, Lieutenant Zakolin, uh, I would also suggest checking the sensor buffer before you leave. If there isn't any uh, information you can take from the main computer, there might still be some telemetry left in uh, the, the dedicated buffer for the sensors themselves. Okay. Um, so that would take you um, into the main science area to access that equipment if you wanted to head there. Um, yeah, I would do that. I basically okay. want to... Because I don't know if there's any evidence of whatever this thing was on the ship, right? Because it was apparently a cloud outside that mm -hmm. somehow killed everyone on the ship. Right. But I still want to look around. Okay. Um, so you head into um, the, the um, science and data collection area. Um, and you find another one of those emitters and another one of those crystal devices being held by um, a, a young gentleman in a blue shirt. I'm gonna plug into that one as well. Okay. This is Lieutenant Kaltoris, and as far as I know, I am the last surviving officer of the USS Valiant. We encountered some sort of energy cloud. Black box emissions profile, but there seemed to be some sort of signal in the noise. When we scanned it, it reacted immediately. It seemed to absorb energy, producing emissions that interfere destructively with any EM radiation it encounters from macro to subatomic scales. Encounters with life forms were uniformly fatal. Our engineer found some way to slow it down, but not stop it. It consumed over 40% of the crew in the first minute. It's breaking through. I don't have much time. The cloud has no physical component, but seems to react to objects. We thought it might be a physical manifestation of subspace phenomenon, but ran out of time. There's an intelligence behind it, though it may be animalistic. Attempts to communicate produce no reaction beyond feeding behaviors. Long-range scans triggered the attack, but it may have only been part of the spectrum we used. It's possible that it will not react to certain scan profiles. We have anecdotal reports that some tricorder scans did not provoke attacks, but no one survived to give details. <sighs> From large energy sources, it took time to counter and absorb them. A big enough source delivered swiftly enough might overwhelm it. <gasps> As you're examining the emitter, um, it's not a standard shield generator. Um, and the best you can, the, the hypothesis that you're able to put forth that kind of makes sense is that this thing just basically generates a magnetic field. So it's not a, a shield in a um, in a Starfleet sense. It just produces um, a very strong magnetic field, but it'd be very localized. Lieutenant and Lieutenant uh, Commander Levine, right? Commander Levine. No, nope, yeah. you took Shore. It's, wing, it's Winky better than you just yeah, four wing, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, that's I'm, fine. I'm I, just making sure I have the right ranks. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You take the upper decks. Uh, Shavor and I will take the lower decks, and we're going to see if we can locate any further crystal lattices and emitters. Okay. Uh, and then reach out to um, the captain, double checking that he's heard this. Uh, especially since he seems a little bit um, distracted <laughs> and just a update of, hey, we're locating these and then we are getting off the ship. So, but we it's will probably be a minute because it's a constitution class and it's not huge, but it's big. 
It's not a galaxy it class, a thank God. <laughs> um, so at this point, the away team splits up into two teams mm -hmm. um, to cover more ground. Yep. Uh, so um, is Levine and Shavor are together and you two are together? Is that accurate? Or are you going the other way? No, I have Shavor. Basically, okay. and I'm Levine. Right, that way there's a yeah, main character on both places. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> uh, but also two <laughs> shuttle pilots on each team. The honor savvy. All right. Um, so the next one you guys locate is in a main weapons control. Um, based on the uniform, this looks like a first officer. Um, there's also one of these emitters and um, one of the crystal lattice devices. So I'll play that log. This is Commander Mastel Gavin of the USS Valley. A little over 30 minutes ago, the ship came under attack by an unknown entity. It manifests as an energy field of about 4,000 kilometers in diameter. It was able to move at warp speeds, though it was only a few minutes before it took our warp core offline. Our attempts to evade it were ineffective. It absorbed energy weapons. Phasers and photon torpedoes were ineffective. Contact with the cloud resulted in immediate fatalities among the crew. Our chief engineer thought maybe concussive force from a conventional high explosive might do some damage, but we never got the chance to try it out. It passed right through our shields and hull. We managed to slow it slightly by randomly altering shield frequencies. It took a moment to adapt, but it was able to adapt quicker than our equipment could modulate them. The things... <sighs> It reads as energy. Uh, it is uh, able to pass through solid objects, but seems to have a physical component to it as well. Our science team uh, wasn't able to figure it out in time. <laughs> uh, this thing seemed to display at least a rudimentary intelligence. It may be controlled from a planetoid structure we scanned in the middle of the cloud before it attacked. Maybe this is some sort of weapon. It, it may be controlled from there. A weapon strike. There might be... Might take out the control mechanism. But we lost main power before we could. And that was just a guess in place. This thing was ignoring us until we started active scans. Then it reacted immediately and aggressively. <laughs> I wanted to add how proud I am of this group. They deserved better. There's several crewmen in this space uh, with Commander Matthews, or pardon me, Commander Gavin. Uh, so it looks like they all were at their posts um, when the cloud came for them. You move further into the hull, um, and again, the density of the crew definitely increases. They were fleeing towards the center of the ship. Um, and you reach a sick bay, and it is a scene of chaos. Um, there is obviously um, a patience but they're uh, on on beds, they're on floors, they're leaning against walls. Sick bay was um, definitely overloaded. Um, there's not a lot of staff that you can see, but you do find another emitter and um, a crystal lattice. This is uh, this this is Jerry. Um, uh, I'm, I'm an ensign of the USS Valiant. I am the last surviving medical staff on the ship, uh, and in a few moments, the casualties will be 100%. Um, just over an hour ago, we started, like, just an hour, 
we started hearing reports of casualties um, fr from all of the decks, uh, starting with those sections closest to the outer hull. Um, some, some sort of energy cloud that invaded the ship. Uh, it, it seemed to feed on energy. Uh, everything from our plasma conduits to uh, electrical impulses, uh, like, like in people. Um, and tendrils of this cloud just kind of passed through corridors and, and crewmen were dead. Like, before they hit the deck, um, one, one crewman managed to survive, um, I think for like a few minutes, in an EM shielded hazardous condition suit, but um, the shielding was eventually overloaded, and then, um, yeah. uh, it feeds, I think, by causing destructive interference with energy sources it encounters, like um, matching the amplitude, but adjusting phase to counter um, as, a, as a consequence of the interference with the nerve impulses. Death is pretty much instantaneous, uh, but painless, I, I think, in theory. Uh, um, as you know, no impulses are able to travel you know, from the affected area. Uh, uh, personnel who had partial contact with the cloud had limbs and appendages rendered lifeless, but survived until, well, until it came back around. Uh, anyone who had partial contact involving any vital organ was killed instantly. Um, the cloud seems to be able to detect EM emissions, uh, even at really small scales. Uh, we theorize that if anyone could mask your biological emissions, the, the cloud would not detect them. But Contact would still be fatal. Oh, oh no. It's here. Moving through the rest of the ship, you make your way down into the, the heart of a living starship, the engineering section. Um, and Commander Kitney, I'll as you go in, like this place is crowded. There's probably close to three shifts worth of engineers in this space. Uh, by the looks of it, they were doing experiments. They were cobbling together stuff. Um, it's, some of it looks like it's incomplete. Um, it looks like they were trying everything they could. Uh, you find another one of those intact emitters. Uh, next to somebody wearing the um, Lieutenant Commander's rank in a gold shirt. Gotcha. Or a red shirt. Hmm? And before, like, starting that up, Kidil's going to call back to Jiffus and basically mm -hmm. get these various things that are in stages also beamed up. Yep. Yeah, you collect all the examples of everything that they were working on. Yep. Um, it will be an uphill road because they don't have records of what they were doing. The only thing you have is what's on the data crystals. Mm -hmm. um, but he'll put his people on it to try and figure that out. Um, so you pick up the device from the chief engineer and plug it into um, your tricorder. Where to start? Okay, this thing needs energy, but it is energy itself. Magnetic shielding is able to slow it down. I was able to trap a piece in a magnetic bottle, but it was able to act independently. When the power fell, so did the seal, and the piece rejoined with the hole. Engineering suits with old fashioned integral shield seem to give it pause, but the internal grounding is overloaded by prolonged contact. Mordica. There is some sort of planetoid in the center of this thing. It could be the source. I thought we might make a big enough magnetic shield to get a shot of through, but the chance never arose. This thing needs any form of EM energy. High energy gamma photons, plasma, you name it, it'll need it. We had had our water cool for lunch, then the auxiliary reactors for dessert. It moves fast, but it 
takes time to absorb energy, depending on the source. A person, a second. Chewed up the warm corn for maybe a few minutes. Maybe it could be overloaded, feed it too much, and it won't choke. I don't know, really. It's just a guess, but it definitely takes time to process more energy. Concussion signal effect, like old fashioned high explosive types. I started working on a concussion bomb. But then it ate the crew before we could finish it. Senior staff, let's get the comms are down. I didn't even know who's alive anymore. But I whipped up a little magnetic shield so they could cover a couple of square meters. I managed to get the transport off using power reserves before the thing drained them too. If any luck, this message too. The uh, power cells on my shield is about done. If anyone on staff then gets this, sees this, I hope it helps. Okay, last words. You gotta say, it was worth it. The ups, the downs, even going up like this, it was worth it. And I don't regret a thing at all. This is Lieutenant Commander F. Matthews of the USS Berlin, signing off. You conduct a moderately thorough search of the rest of the ship, um, and you don't find any other uh, of these crystal devices. Is there anything um, left of the warp core on the Valiant? Like, could we get it? Does, is it fuel, air quotes, right, remaining? Dilithium um, crystals. The dilithium crystals are intact, um, but there's no sign of any matter or antimatter. Um, to f to create the reaction that would produce enough power. Um, it's a working hypothesis might be that it was drawing extra matter antimatter into the chamber to consume that energy, mm -hmm. um, and that would have drained the reserves fairly quickly if it's able to consume energy at a rapid rate. So the warp core appears to be intact. Um, it would just have to be restarted. Um, all the energy systems appear to be intact. The controls, the control computers and things like that would need to be reset or new control mechanisms put in place. Um, so it is possible that you'd be able to salvage the ship, but it would take some effort and you definitely don't have the crew to be running it. So you do a, a search of the rest of the ship and don't find any more uh, data crystals. You've got five samples of that shield that was apparently effective. Um, and uh, the prototype that they used before that. Um, and you've got the five data crystals um, with the recordings. Um, that's about all that's salvageable. And you've got about a dozen other experiments and things that they were working on in the engineering shops. Yeah, I kind of just want to seal the ship back up and head on back to our ship yep. and get this data out back on the subspace beacons immediately. And, yeah. Also, I don't want to be in this zone. <laughs> yep. Yeah, um, basically, if we time skip over to the shuttle getting back, Craig? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, basically chatting with the captain and uh, regard... <laughs> We need to leave the Valiant here. We will mark it. We will register its coordinates. We need to move away from this space. Sir. Uh, he calls us a con. <clears throat> uh, take us out of the void at the commander's orders, Ensign. Um, Narkek is at your shoulder. Just an idea, Captain, but we could leave a beacon here. Let folks know that this is a memorial. Operating standard hailing frequencies. Nothing eats transmissions. I was just saying. Uh, he looks at Narkek with a, a melancholy expression and then holds up a finger and calls to Jeffus again. Mm -hmm. Says, 
Commander Jiffis, have you made progress on um, on a means to shield EM transmissions? Now that will take some time, sir. Well, the reason why I ask is if you have something that would work for, say, a, a probe of the smallest size, that'd be convenient if we could oh, implement it immediately. That I could do. Oh, wonderful. Would it still permit um, subspace transmissions? Yes. Fantastic. All right. Uh, um, it takes them a, a little while to whip up the probe, but you guys leave it behind um, as a marker uh, for the ship. And a warning. And a warning. Yes, um, because I, I, in in my head, you know, Kidneal is suggesting something along the lines of here, press the USS Valiant, you know, you know, all crew lost, you know, not a place of honor. Yes, one hundred percent. Do not investigate this ship, um, you know, and some reference to the void. Yeah, just it, like because I'm imagining there's some. Federation report number whatever that we're going to be sending back and just like, hey, if you want to know what the hell is going on here, see this report submitted by the USS Curie on such and such date, whatever. Um, but don't come check this thing out. Uh, if you're hearing this beacon, maybe back it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah if you hear this beacon, something as going. well. Sure, right. Because uh, our crew was able to make uh, unique progress with subspace transmissions and subspace technology. Would the probe function uh, at a greater distance than is typical? Well, it would be able to reach because as you've been traveling, you've been laying a subspace communications network. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it would definitely be able to reach that network and then get elsewhere from there. Okay. So anybody Fantastic. who's operating on on that network that you've laid would be able to contact the probe. All right. I'm just curious uh, how, f what, what the furthest reach of the probe is um, independent of the, the subspace beacons. So what I mean is we have this probe here to advertise a warning. Yes. How close does someone need to be in order to hear that warning? They could pick it up at the borders of the void. Fantastic. That's what I was trying to confirm. Excellent. Wonderful. Great. Okay. Um, so the USS Curie uh, sets course the most direct route possible to get out of the um, the Hero, um, Hikil Void. Um, it's going to be a trip of about a day or so. Um, and the mood on word spreads quickly. I mean, the Curie is a fairly small ship and a fairly tight-knit community, so word spreads pretty quickly about um, not necessarily all the details, but of the salient um, um, ideas of what was found and um, what was discovered. Um, in the time before you guys get out of the void, what are you going to be about? Well, as soon as everybody gets back, uh, there's going to be a debrief. Mm -hmm. All right, so senior staff in the ready room mm -hmm. or in the conference room? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the latter. Am I just here with this corpse still or? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, so I wanted to engage on that, but I wanted to establish what was going to happen there. So um, once uh, the, we stop talking to each other and the away team is moving about and assembling everything, the captain is immediately going to leave uh, the bridge mm -hmm. uh, and head to sick bay to talk to okay. Dr. Hudson. All right. Um, Dr. Hudson is uh, I w just for um, story purposes the thawing out has happened. Okay. Um, so there is what a do I establish to be a cause of death here? Um, as far as you can tell there's no particular cause of death. Um, it's like everything just sort of stopped. Um, there's no um, injuries, there's no pathogens, um, all the organs appear to be more or less intact, except necrosis is set in um, on a large scale. Yeah, if there are specific investigations you wanted to do, let me know. Yeah, I mean. 
uh, right outside the door. Mm-hmm. The captain stops and takes a deep breath and composes himself the best he can, and mm-hmm. then enters and uh, is kind of standing awkwardly uh, off to the side and behind Dr. Hudson. Captain, you know I don't like people lurking in my med bay. Apologies, Doctor. He seems uncharacteristically reticent. Uh, And then um, he clears his throat and says, Mm. Do you have a means by which uh, we might preserve Captain Andorra's body until she can receive a fitting burial back on Andoria? Sure. Captain, permission to speak freely? Granted. You would admit that I am not the first person on this ship that would be uh, designated as a empathetic person? Yes. And yet, even I can tell something has put a shadow across your path today with this ship. And I don't mean as a captain, I mean as a man. That is true. How much would you like me to share? Whatever you feel comfortable with. Whatever helps you process. He nods and looks down. Looks back up. And he says, Captain Andorra mentored me. I served under her on the USS Monaco and suffered an injury that led to me being on sick leave when she was assigned to the USS Valiant. I would have been a part of that crew. And the fact that she never returned from those missions, or from her mission, it was one of my main motivations for wanting to go on, on our own. See? You've gotten the answer I seek. It just wasn't the one I wanted. Sure. Sometimes this we... Sometimes we know what the answer is, but refuse to see it until we have the evidence. I'm sorry that... I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you, Doctor. He places a hand on your shoulder. And he says, um, he clears his throat and uh, straightens up a bit and says, uh, I'll leave you to the preparations, if that's okay with you. And uh, when you're done, I'm sure we'll all want to meet in the conference room to debrief. Be there shortly. The captain nods. Cool. And, and then and leaves. Fast forward in there. Yep. Cool. Uh, okay. Ralph, would Kitney will recognize yes. the captain's name from like previous conversations that they may have had and stuff like that? You know, he probably would have mentioned her um, without saying that she was on the Valiant. But you know, enough was, to recognize the spot. name. Yeah, yeah. He probably would have mentioned the time they spent together on the Monaco, but never said that. However, I mean, of course, it was information publicly, or I wouldn't say publicly available, readily available. What the 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 um, 
the crew disposition was on these Constitution class ships, right? Mm-hmm. So Kitney, I would probably already know, but um, it and 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 considering that. It, it might have occurred to Kitneal that it was strange that the captain never referred to her um, in her capacity on the Valiant. Well, and more specifically here, wanting to know that Kitneal's walking in knowing. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah, at the conference room, you know, Kitneal's more than happy to kind of start the conversation and just mm-hmm. be like, uh, at this point, I do not think that there is anything that. But I think more bluntly, he says, "I don't think our ship needs to go on a um, whale hunting excursion." I don't disagree with that sentiment. And like immediately, Kidney relaxes a little bit. He's like, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> it's like dude you never know with those andorians they get a little yeah. bit hot blooded and it's <laughs> like hang on <laughs> i'll kill you you fucker <laughs> but yeah uh i think our ship yeah even with the knowledge we gained here would be far outclassed that's a mission for someone with more power that and somebody who's more prepared we're we would be yes putting stuff together ad hoc so Someone who is prepared with lots of explosives. Uh, Thank you, Commander Jeffis speaks up. Um, not to sound argumentative, but we have a huge advantage that the Valiant did not. We know what they faced. Um, And we know things that they tried and successes. We also know things that didn't work. Commander, a while ago, you and I had a discussion about we can't know everything that we might encounter out here. And that's sort of the point of us being here. But it was important for us to leave a record of what we do find, even if we meet a similar fate. That's the gift that they gave us. In their final moments, they weren't about despair. They gave us hope. I don't disagree, but our purpose and our charter is not to hunt down space monsters. If the crew of the Valiant has given us a gift, it is our duty to see that it is treated well. And if the captain or Starfleet requests us to go on a whale hunting mission, I am more than happy to make that happen. But we will find dry dock. We will find some place where we can properly retrofit. And like puts his hand on the bulkhead and says, and turn our curie the most badass whale hunting motherfucker out there. <laughs> Insert appropriate Star Trek era. <laughs> sure. But we are not some escort cruiser. We're an exploratory vessel. Captain nods and says, The commander's right. If we're going to go after Moby Dick, you need to get one hell of a harpoon first. Captain, the entire point of that story is that you shouldn't go chasing the whale. Just to clarify yeah. the metaphor. 
Captain like raises an eyebrow. <laughs> it's, like, it's not it's not the story that the Andorians it's not the way the Andorians yeah. tell it. <laughs> I think that's a bit open interpretation. Yeah. <laughs> is it though? Uh, yeah, the the humans... version of the tale is this hero, you know, dives into his mouth with the new Chantor. Right, yeah, exactly. Watches his way out and earns <laughs> victory. Like, so, something gets lost in translation. Up through the brain. Yeah. <laughs> Perry's correct. He's only heard the Klingon uh, version. <laughs> but, then, but, then, but, then, but then he says, um, there was some of that Klingon sex poetry, huh? Oh, yeah, you know it. Um, he, uh, but then he says, M- my point is, uh, Dr. Hudson, is that if we are going to undertake what is likely a dangerous and foolish endeavor, we should be better armed than we currently are. So you agree that we shouldn't? Uh, I agree that in the present moment, it is outside of our mission to enter the void in a quest for vengeance. Okay. Um, and he mutters under his breath, however much I so desire it. Um, and then he says, uh, however, uh, we are transmitting this information to Starfleet right now. So it might happen that as we travel through the rest of this region of space, we are given or we find other regions to return to the void in search of information. And if we do, we might encounter this thing. Which reminds me, uh, and like Kit Neal makes just like a mental, actually an actual note on his you know data pad. Um, we should probably make sure that stellar cartography is uh, watching this region and the event that further, um, I would assume, stars are consumed. Yeah, the expansion of this void. And track its potential movement. Excellent idea. Can I leave that to you, Lieutenant Zakolin? Of course. If there are no other pressing scenes somebody wants to fit in, this is probably a good spot to wrap. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you, everybody, for joining us as we um, tie a bow on our Star Trek Adventures little mini-series. I'd like to give a special thank you um, to a cloudbound Corky, who was the voice of Captain Andorra. A Camo, who was left hand commander Matthews, Noctal, and Commander Gavin. I think I got everybody matched up properly. Doc Doc Huvian 117 was Lieutenant Torres, and Moku was Port Ensign Cherry. Um, thank you very much for contributing. Um, these are um, an offer I made to patrons to um, give us a little extra depth to our little wrap up. Um, and I oh, just wanted to. Awesome. Ask, the point of all just to highlight that this was really dangerous, the stuff that they were engaged in. And um, a few of those ships that went out in the original missions just never came back. And I wanted to sort of have a little um, homage to explorers and the risks um, of exploring. It was uh, T.S. Eliot who said, uh, We shall not cease from exploration, that the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. That's sort of the the driving motivation behind a lot of human endeavor. And that's reflected well, I think, in the Star Trek series, and I wanted to take a moment to pay homage to that. So thank you for joining us in our little wrap up. Um, we're going to be taking a quick break uh, as we tend to our real human bodies. Um, and we'll come back in our second half with our Geist Session Zero. Then I'm in charge, motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. YouTube folks, <laughs> Uh, hi, this is the end of this episode. You'll have to go check the Section Zero video for the Geist thing, if you're into that, which you should be. You should be. <laughs> I'm into it enough for everybody. <laughs> Back in a sec. Oh.